Hi, and welcome to the unicorn in the room. I'm Mike Kiriakou. I'm an industry fellow at UC Berkeley, and it's my pleasure to give you a version of my eight-week course, compressed as it is into maybe 17 minutes, if we're lucky. The subtitle is find, Using AI to Find Opportunities Hiding in um, Plain Sight, and we'll see why that became an extreme challenge as part of this journey. So first, a little bit about me. Let me move this on. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur originally from Australia, which is why I talk a little funny. Uh, I'm an engineer, entrepreneur, investor, and advisor. And who do I advise? VC funds, accelerators, universities, ventures, and startups. Uh, a few years ago, I started Stratica Labs, which, among other things, uses high uh, dimensional anomaly detection to analyze companies, which will feature strongly in what we're about to see. I'm also an industry fellow at UC Berkeley, and more to the point, I love to connect the dots. I love to connect person to person, solution to problem, product to market, uh, all of the above. Let's press on. So it was one lovely morning, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, Berkeley campus, as it was, when I was meeting with a friend of mine, Ken Singer, who's the, as people probably know, is the director of um, the SCET, and we were catching up. And Ken said, what are you up to recently? And I said, well, you know, I have this company, Stratica Labs. We're doing high dimensional anomaly detection. And I explained what it was. And so Ken said, mm, that's very interesting because I have just seen, I've just read a book about the power of positive deviance. And I think high degree anomaly detection, high dimensional anomaly detection, positive deviance, these two ideas should be able to come together. Intuitively, I said, of course they can. And so began the journey. Little did I know that these two ideas do not necessarily go together at all. And this is the story of how they didn't come together. And eventually, after some thought, how they did come together and create something quite new. So let's begin. Well, it begins with just understanding the wisdom of outliers. And there's no better example than the study of mal child malnutrition in Vietnam by the uh, two researchers, Jerry Stern and, Mon and Monique Sterling. Now, what they realized, I mean, they were in Vietnam, they were asked to um, address this terrible problem of uh, childhood malnutrition, which was endemic across the country. And they only had six months to do this. And they realized that the world leading expert on raising a healthy family in a Vietnamese village isn't a couple of researchers from Harvard but it's a healthy family in a Vietnamese village. And so because they only had six months, they couldn't figure out a solution. So they looked to see what was working right now against all odds. And so they measured every child in the village or in all the villages by height and by weight to see who were malnourished and to see if there were any outliers. Lo and behold, there were. There were a few children who were healthy, a few families whose children uh, um, uh, did not suffer for the same uh, mortality rates as, as other families and other villages. And when they studied what that behavior was, uh, I mean, there was a subset that were actually things we can ignore. For instance, it's what's called true but useless. That is, a few of them had rich uncles who were providing the resources. That's not really a replicable solution. Uh, a few of them had other outside help. Again, not really replicable but there were many areas that were, and two in particular. The families who had children who were healthy did two things differently. They left the, the leaves in when they were mixing the rice from the fields. And they also left in the crustaceans, little short prawns and shrimps that were just living <clears throat> in, in and around the, the water there. They left those things in and it provided the minerals and the protein for the children to grow up healthy. Now, that those two insights were able to be replicated across the population and it had massive positive impact. And this was the beginning of understanding the power of positive deviance. Now, since then, we have uh, some, a lot of positive success stories. Some also, some, uh, it's not always universal. Here's some cases where it really did work. An 80% reduction in childhood malnutrition um, uh, affecting a total of 22.3 million uh, um, people, 50% reduction in malnutrition across 41 uh, countries worldwide, 
a 50% increase in primary school attendance uh, in, uh, in Argentina, and 80% reduction in uh, uh, child trafficking, uh, affecting 400 children, expanding to 19,000 at-risk children. So clearly, positive deviance uh, can have a, a, a wonderful and positive impact. Uh, another way of viewing this is a great quote by William Gibson, who created the term cyberspace. And he said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Well, that's great. So far, so good. Here's the thing. From what we've just seen, positive deviance is all about taking field notes and understanding the height of children that you write down and the weight of children and weighing them and so on. Now, that sort of level of data is great. We've seen it has really great impact. Here's the problem, that my area is high, di high dimensional anomaly detection uh, with big data, petabytes. Well, you don't need petabytes of data for, uh, for solving these big problems. Is this redundant? Is this marriage which we are seeking actually going to come to fruition? What is the missing piece here? Will we ever get to a point where these two areas can be positive? Well, we go further to consider it a bit better. And it turns out we have something. Let's, to, to understand it, let's look closer at the process of positive deviance. We first define a problem. We then determine who those outli where those outliers are, who are doing things better. And then we understand why they're succeeding against all odds. What is it? What are those replicable behaviors? And when we find them, we design a solution to roll it out to the whole population. And that's what impacts lives. Now, the issue here, the, the thing here is we are limited to the, um, a small amount of data that can be entered into notebooks and then rolling this out by a process which really is um, sourced by and then a solution which is led by the community. Now, what happens if we take away that limitation? We still keep this core functionality but what would happen if we take away those limits? It means that once we understand outliers and think about a solution, we can, we, we're not necessarily confined to um, this, this very um, tight definition, but we can think of something we, we might call generalized positive deviance. That is that if we have this, this could lead to a breakthrough which we can publish as a new discovery which doesn't necessarily have to involve healthcare. This could also lead to, an, this discovery could also lead to a new venture. And suddenly we can imagine that there are two axes. <clears throat> There's data availability, whether it's handwritten notes at one side of the scale or petabytes on the other. And similarly agency, that is who is, in, who is in responsible for the insight and the rollout of the solution, either the community sources the solution and implements it, or a founder or researcher sources a solution and does something with that insight. Well, we can see the classic positive deviance um, fits comfortably in this left-hand corner. That is not to diminish the massive and massive, uh, massively um, positive impact it, it, it has in the world. But there is this much broader solution space we might call, again, pos general positive deviance which can um, uh, involve co um, corporate innovation, discovery, and venture. Well, let's look at where under, we're following anomalies uh, regardless, uh, without these uh, limitations can lead. Well, let's, you know, a lot of the time we can take comfortable, comfort in the normal distribution, or can we? Normally what we would do is study this normal distribution, looks like quite a strong normal, um, normal distribution here. Uh, and understand the trend. And it just ignore this thing over here. But here's the thing. Why is this an anomaly? And it's not just one or two. It's probably about six. There are six anomalies at this point. What's going on? And it's the study of the green and not the white that can lead to great uh, innovation and discovery. Let's peer a bit further at some examples. Well, a great, a great quote by Isaac Asimov is that the most exciting phrase to hear in science and the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, I have found it, but that's funny. Let's have a look. Newton, 
hundreds of years ago, solved the whole problem of the universe with his Principia by saying, well, you know, measure speed depends on um, where and how you're moving. And Maxwell said, well, when you measure the speed of light, it's always the same. And for everyone else on the planet, these two seemed like a uh, com completely compatible to everyone except one person, the 26 year old Einstein, who said, well, that's funny. These two ideas don't go together. These are incompatible. And this investigation led, of course, to his theory of relativity, that, that speeds actually dilate space and time and high speeds can actually be measured. It dilates measuring devices as well, which is why we see this dichotomous uh, relationship. Of course, it led to a Nobel Prize for among other things, his theory of relativity. Similarly, Owens uh, had a lab assistant who was measuring temperatures uh, and resistance as temperatures dropped and suddenly it stopped working uh, at a certain temperature. And the lab assistant said, that's fine. And he said, well, what is it? He said, no, don't worry. He said, no, no, no tell me. He said, oh, that's funny. He said, well, it's just that uh, it, you know, it stopped working. When, when Owens w dis, uh, uh, delved further, it turns out that he had discovered the phenomena of superconductivity. Penzias and Wilson, the not to name, to make, give too many examples here to label the point, had a new teles uh, were trying to work a new radio telescope. And whatever they did, they couldn't get rid of an annoying buzzing sound. They cleaned it, they removed bird poop, they, they treated all of the signals, no matter what, there was an annoying at a certain consistent level, um, of micro at the microwave level. And they said, well, that's funny. Why is that? It turns out what they discovered was the very first evidence of the Big Bang, Nobel Prize once again. Nor are these things limited to breakthrough, like I said. This, what we see before us here, is a 50-year-old milkshake machine salesman. And uh, he had lived a, lived a fairly ordinary life until a new customer ordered a huge number of milkshake machines. Far too many to be practical. And he said, well, that's funny. Why would this little outfit, the McDonald brothers in, in California, be ordering so many milkshake machines? What's going on? He went there, tried the burgers, and the rest, as they say, is history. McDonald's is arguably one of the greatest investment return on capital investments um, the 20th century has known. Similarly, who is this band of mass murderers? Not a band of mass murderers, in fact. And if we had an audience here, I would ask who recognizes these people. Well, the second half makes it a bit easier, particularly this gentleman here, Bill Gates. This is in fact the, um, the nascent Microsoft who noticed something. And that is that as IBM raced to catch up with Apple and the other PCs, they, they, they were able to get there very fast by commoditizing the hardware. But it was only Bill Gates who said, well, that's funny. If you're commoditizing the hardware, that makes the operating system the only thing of value. And so by owning the operating system and uh, being able to uh, use, utilize it in many different, uh, with many different competitors, uh, Microsoft took all of the value from, from um, that chapter of, of the computing history, of computing history. Of course, you know, Microsoft are a powerhouse even to this day. Similarly, um, when Elon Musk looked at the cost of a rocket and the cost of, of car production and then married it back to the underlying physics, the underlying cost of what those materials are, he saw a huge disparity. He said, that's funny. And again, this led to these huge, um, um, the, the, to multiple unicorns. So it's simply by understanding this, this, this dichotomy between these two things. Well, what anomalies might, be, what might we be ignoring right now? I have a whole load of these. Here's just one I want to touch on. Now, this uh, rather technical area here is um, the very first evidence of what we call the Higgs boson, which is what gives um, mass its mass. Uh, and it was, this, was, uh, this discovery was of no practical value in daily life. Apparently, it was so, so said. Uh, but here's the thing. If the Higgs field gives, uh, um, if there's no Higgs field, if it's possible in the future, in hundreds of years time, to eliminate the Higgs field, maybe it eliminates mass. And maybe that means then that interstellar travel is 
possible? Is, that, is, is this what we're going to see one day? And if so, this is something that's right in front of us that we're ignoring, possibly. It's funny anyway. Okay, so when we, when we delve into this deviant data, what should we be doing and what should we see? What are some practical areas? Well, we need to find out what unusual behavior is common for these positive deviants. So this gives us questions to ask, and we need to try and confirm or, dis, uh, or disprove our findings. We need to understand why. A great quote by Jeff Bezos says, if this is a decision, if this is, let me start again. If this is a decision based on opinions, my opinion wins, but data beats opinion. So bring data. So the other thing is there are limits to only a data approach. And that is that the real world is often more nuanced than the data you collect. It's often that we miss some features when we're collecting the data, or even if we have all the data we need, it may not necessarily explain why. We need to understand the why behind the data. Why did it lead to this? And if, if humans are involved in your, um, in your domain, then you need to go back and talk to them and really understand what it is. The reason why is because you start with data information, knowledge, insight, wisdom. Now, if you keep on going and extrapolate, you end up in a crazy place. So it's very important that with your conclusions, you go back and check. Okay. Another great quote here is by Eric Ries, who says, metrics are people too. And that is that whatever you're measuring about people, you're, uh, it's a person that's being measured and you need to understand what, it is it that what is it that they're doing. So we have our insights. Are we done? Can we go home now that we've generated these incredible insights? Let's see, because now we need to maximize the impact from these insights. And to illustrate this point, there's no one better in history to, exp to, to, um, to, um, to use as an example than Leonardo da Vinci, who, well, not, I, we don't have time to talk about all these different areas, but let's say that in his life, he uh, had generated massive insights, greater probably than anyone who's ever lived. And yet, because he published almost nothing, he had basically zero impact in history. He, is an, he has an impact now that he inspires us to be the greatest that humans can be, but he made almost no contribution in any of these areas where he could have had massive, massive impact. Similarly, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived is Carl Gauss, and he had a saying called few but right, and that is that he, he didn't like to uh, pub he only published his very finest works. And it is said, and it, I just moved it forward, so you don't got a preview of that. And he said, it is said that if he only published everything, then the current state of mathematics would have been 50 years on by now. We've lost 50 years of mathematics because Carl Frederick Gauss didn't publish everything. That means we could have had the mathematics of 2070 today. So it's his fault there's no flying cars. I don't know. I need someone to blame. So we could actually view this on a, on a scale again, on, on a chart again. So if we assume that there are some, say for instance, monks who um, uh, have no new ideas and do not proliferate, stay in a monastery, and there is Da Vinci who has massive ideas and, but didn't proliferate, and Gauss who had a, a few, had a lot of ideas and proliferated a little bit. Einstein actually did a quite a good job of both. Justin Bieber, and I try to choose the most annoying picture of Justin Bieber. My apologies to any Bieber, Bieber fans. I don't think there are any, but apologies just in case you're out there. Um, who didn't have a lot of ideas, to be honest, but oh boy, did he proliferate. And Uber and other unicorns who are insightful and do a pretty good job of proliferating. So, you know, you can imagine our impact in life is a function of our insight multiplied by our proliferation. And we want to excel in both. So our insights must proliferate. And now we understand that by combining, um, by, by not being bound by the level of data uh, um, and nor by who implements the solution, we're finally able to marry these two ideas. And hence, uh, in, um, uh, I ended up uh, running the course uh, as a happy marriage, applied machine learning, positive deviance, and anomaly detection.
And to this point, general positive deviance now, which we created out of this union, is now an area that we're looking into. We're uh, beginning a great collaboration with a whole load of areas that just did not exist before. Uh, so it sprouted a lot, uh, some green fields and research, uh, as well as some very practical findings. So thank you very much. So I just want to say, we, this allows us, uh, general positive events allows us to impact lives, corporate innovation, research, new ventures. And in fact, imagine this impact that we can have now. We can positively impact millions of lives. We can transform organizations. We can lead breakthroughs in science and technology or generate startups that apply to any or all of the above. This then is the power of positive deviance. And to use Matsuno Daliweo's uh, quote, if you can see what others cannot see, you can do what others cannot do. Thank you. <laughs>